Good evening, everyone. My name is Sister Joyce, and I'm pastoral associate here at Our Lady of Pompeii Parish. Welcome to our monthly Faith Enrichment Speaker Series. As you know, our speaker this evening is Father Richard Shepka. Father Rich has been serving our diocese and helping form seminarians for over 40 years. Now as the moderator of the beloved Disciples of Christ the Lord family of parishes, he is committed to strengthening our six parishes and uniting our family as well. Tonight, Father Rich will present to us a topic that is most appropriate as we approach both Valentine's Day and Ash Wednesday this week. His topic is the way of the heart. Please join me in welcoming Father Richard Shepka. Well, good evening, everyone. Glad to be with you. Um, let's start with scripture, and then we'll continue on our journey today. Um, this is a passage, famous passage from uh, the prophet Micah. And so let us listen to the word of God. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. God, our fathers, we stand on the threshold of another season of Lent. We ask you to help us to follow you as you call us to, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with you. Help us to use the image of the heart that you have given us as a way to find you more deeply in our lives. Bless us now as we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Listening to that introduction, I was thinking of a story a while ago. There was a governor of a state in New England who was campaigning for re-election. And in the fall, he was going from village to village, visiting the town square and the like. And one particular village, after a long day of campaigning, was having a festival. And he was hungry, so he decided it would be a good image. He got in line for the chicken dinner. And so when it was his turn to be served, the woman who was serving gave him a rather small piece of chicken. And he said, uh, ma'am, I, I'm, I'm rather hungry. Could I have another one? Oh, no, no, one to a customer, sorry. So, well, ma'am, I've been working all day and everything. I'm kind of, no, one to a customer. Finally, she, he got a little peeved and said, ma'am, do you know who I am? I'm the governor of this state. And she looked at him and said, and you know who I am? I'm the woman in charge of the chicken. Now move along. So you know who I am? I'm the moderator of this family of parishes and doesn't get me a bigger piece of chicken either. So there we go with that. But I'm very happy to be with you. And um, this is a wonderful time. We're not quite at Lent yet. Um, we have Mardi Gras tomorrow for anybody who celebrates that. But it is a wonderful way for me to, uh, I think for myself at least, to set off the season of coming season of Lent with this presentation. And it comes to this, um, and if you look at the... Uh, images on the screens there. I kind of have a follow along with you. But um, in planning for the upcoming season of Lent, if I'm not mistaken, the parish here at Our Lady Pompeii has chosen the theme of the Sacred Heart to be kind of a Lenten uh, theme for us. And you notice the banner that's up here in front of the Sacred Heart of Jesus that will be there for the Lenten season. And it got me thinking that it's really um, a wonderful idea for a Lenten theme. When I was asked to give this presentation a few months ago, and I was looking at what I could present on, I suggested this title, The Way of the Heart. And I want to use the heart and the sacred heart of Jesus as kind of a jumping off point to present a view of how we live our lives as spiritual people. And the important thing for me is how to live as an integrated person. Um, it fits very well with what's been a kind of a personal journey of mine to find something that puts the very different aspects of our life together so that we're the same person. Whatever we're doing, we're the same person. I've noticed in my life, I'm sure you have in, in yours, I tend to wear different hats. 
At one time here, I'm a priest. Another time, I'm my, uh, a member of the family. I'm an uncle. I'm this. I'm a boss. I'm this. With everything along the line, it's sort of like, okay, where am I? What am I doing? And we need to find some sense of unity that we're the same person, whatever whatever task we have before us. And for me, that image has become the heart. The heart is that image that brings it all together. And in our Catholic tradition, I've also used the sacred heart of Jesus as an important part of that, because my heart connects with the sacred heart of Jesus to put me in contact with our Savior. I have to admit, it's a little bit of a personal story for me. Um, we have this image here, there's another one there. Um, I have memory as a child, a very small, young child, of this picture, as close as I can remember, it's the picture that you have up here, hanging in our house. And I don't remember if it was in the living room or my bedroom, but I remember seeing it as a very young child. We're talking three, four years old. And I have to be honest, I was afraid of it. Because here was this picture of Jesus, and he, he doesn't look overly happy, but doesn't look mad or anything. But I kept wondering, why is his heart on the outside? What's wrong? What's this all about? And it took me a while to figure out what it represented. At the same time, my dear mother loved this image of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. She kept a picture or a statue, something along with her always. So I kept saying, okay, there's something here. There's something about the Sacred Heart that's valuable to me. And once I got over the, uh, the little child looking at it oddly, I began to realize what a wonderful source of strength it could be for all of us. And it is precisely that heart that's the image that I need to put my life in, together, to keep it organized, to be the same person as we go along. And so, where'd the slide go? <laughs> Excuse me a second. Oh, there's a slide missing, no problem, we'll get through it. The heart, if you look at scripture, when we think of a heart, we think basically maybe Wednesday is Valentine's Day. The heart is the sign of love. And that's good and that's proper in a sense, but it's very limited if we only see the heart as the source of our emotions, especially romantic emotions, because the heart in scripture was so much more than that. The heart in essence is the inside, the totality of the person. And we see that in scripture, for example, it's the heart that's the seat of memories. What do we think of with memories? We, we think of our mind, we keep our things close to us. But in scripture, it was, the mind was not thought of in that way. The heart was the sense where you gathered all your memories. And the best example of that is in Luke's gospel with the Virgin Mary. Because at the time of Christ's birth, many times throughout the times when she becomes part of the gospel message, Luke will tell us, and Mary treasured all these things in her heart. And it makes it a little bit more intimate, a little bit more personal. That it wasn't just some outside memory that was there, it was something that was inside her, something that was deep. So the heart was the source of your memories. And that's something very valuable for us. It's also the place where our future is decided. The heart is where we saw the signs around us and we decide where we're being led. Let us, we ask ourselves, what is our heart saying about our future? Where is our heart leading us? What's important to us that we want to spend our life in that direction? And so the heart was the seat of memories, that means the past, all scattered in the heart. But it was in the heart where future plans were made as well. And if that is the seat of both the past and the future, at the same time, it's also the reality of the present. One aspect of that present is that that's where decisions were made. We decide things in the here and now coming from the heart if we're being authentic about it, if it's being the true us, because the heart was the place where decisions were made. There's this biblical expression, you always talk about a hardened heart. Well, a hardened heart, we would probably call better a closed mind. If you were open to the works of God, your heart was as it should be. If it were not, 
you had a hardened heart, a closed heart, a closed mind to what God was calling you to do. And so the heart then becomes the seat of the past, present, and future. The heart, therefore, is the whole us, the real us. We all put on false fronts sometimes. We all pretend we're something we're not. We all have some kind of falsity about us. But if you strip that all away, what you have left is the heart, what's really you, the true inside of us. So the heart is the real person. And it's that real person, that's where our spiritual life, that's where our life of prayer begins. When we put aside all the airs that we have, put aside all the pretenses, the heart essentially is where we meet God. It's the true us because God knows it. We can't put on airs with God, we can't fool God. So if we're to be authentic people, and we're all called to be authentic, we speak to God from the heart. And I think that's why the image of the sacred heart becomes so important to us, because we speak to God from the heart, and Jesus who loved us, and Jesus who died for us, speaks to us from his heart as well. That's an important reality. Heart speaks to heart. And that's the important part of who we are as people. We see that throughout scripture. We see that in 1 Samuel. Mortals look at appearances, but God sees the heart. The prophet Isaiah writes, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. That's the place where we truly meet the real God. We are our true authentic selves. And that's an important reality. Probably the most famous passage that brings up to this is from Ezekiel chapter 36. And let me read that for you. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness and from all your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and make you follow my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. Then you shall live in the land that I gave to your ancestors and you shall be my people and I will be your God. Such a beautiful image of God reaching in and taking out our hearts of stone, our hardened hearts, and giving us hearts of flesh, a real heart, where we are authentic, we are true to ourselves. And so very powerfully, that becomes the real image of the heart, the sense of the true us. And part of that is the interna internalness of us, the inside of us. Not that we're big on externals. Sometimes we get caught up with the externals, the trappings, the outside, how we look to others and what it might seem to appear that we're doing. But if it's only mere action and not coming from the heart, it can be a mistake. It can be not the real us. It can be us fooling ourselves on where we are coming from. And so it's in the heart that we're called to be with God. It's from the heart that we're called to be holy. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I'll put this all up at once. Just a little background. I tend to do this with scripture. What does scripture mean by holy? Because there is uh, in the Old Testament an image of holiness which is good for us, but something I think even in our modern world, we've even kind of moved a little bit beyond that. But in Hebrew, there's the root, kadash or kodesh. And it really means anything pertaining to the nature of God itself, himself. It refers to something or some, anyone or anything set aside, separated from the world. So to be holy meant to be set apart. Material objects like bowls and cups were holy if they were only used for the temple. So they had a part of being separated from the rest of the world, reserved for God himself. And that's the framework for holiness then. That's the framework for what it means to be holy, to be with God himself. And so with that in mind, we use the heart to determine how we are to love, how we are to live, how are we to be in union with God. And so it's sort of a framework for holiness. Here again, another scripture passage, very familiar one, um, that I think we're going to talk about for the rest of the evening today. 
a framework for holiness. And that's the dual command to love Christ, to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. It comes from Mark's gospel and other places as well. But Mark, one of the scribes, when he came forward and heard them disputing and saw how well he had answered them, asked him, which is the first of all the commandments? Jesus answered, the first is this, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. The scribe said to him, well said, teacher, you are right in saying he is one and there is no other than he. And so to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is worth more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he had answered with understanding, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And no one dared to ask him any more questions. And so right there we have that same reality that from the heart, if you love from the heart with all your heart, all your soul, we have the reality of the heart being the authentic person, the true person, the person who we are. And so what we have there, as we see, is really love God, love neighbor, but also implied by that, love of God, love of neighbor. But the third is implied the love of self. And actually, we'll see in a moment, it really begins with the love of self. And so, words familiar, this is nothing you haven't heard before. The two commandments, the great commandments, are a very important part of our teachings. To love God and to love our neighbor as ourself. But I think that it can be expanded a little bit to kind of carry together as a unifying factor for all our life. And what I really need to do with that is that from those, that very simple two commandments, I see two kinds of, five kinds rather, five kinds of love that spring from the gospel. And that kind of covers our entire life, not just our life with God, and even not just our life with our neighbor, but our entire being. It really kind of encompasses our heart so that we are who we're called to be. The heart becomes a symbol of unity for us. And so quite simply, there is love of God. We'll talk about this more in a moment, what that means. But the love of neighbor can be looked into in different aspects. Because what we, need, we mean by neighbor, Scripture asks that question many times, who is my neighbor? There's different ways to look at our call to love neighbor. First of all, there's a call to love all our neighbors, to love the human race, to love humanity. And in Scripture, that love of neighbor calls us to be concerned for them, to be of service to them. And so there's love of neighbor, which the Greek term, we see diakonia, which means service. That's service to mankind, that's service to loving all human race. That's part of loving neighbor, is loving all people. But we have to be a little bit more than just loving neighbors in general. There's a fifth quote I had, a plaque I had years ago of Linus from, from Peanuts characters. And it had Linus saying very simply, I love humanity, it's people I can't stand. So we have to go more than an abstract love of neighbor. We have to really love certain people. And so we have to be part of a community. That's a very important part for being a Christian, of course. Jesus told us where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm in your midst. Didn't say anything about being alone. And so part of love of neighbor means a general love for all humanity, but at the same time, a love of community, the people we live with. The Greek term is koinonia, a sense of, of fellowship, if you will, with the people that we are at. It's a very important reality as part of our love of neighbor. But there's a fourth one as well, a third kind of neighborly love, if you will, because we love the human race, we love the people we're around, but at the same time, there's a particular love, an individual love, in Greek, it's called philia, a friendship, if you will. We'll talk about that in a moment. But we have to love individual people who are part of the community, who are part of the greater whole. So it gets a little bit more particular. We love all God's people. But we can't love them all equally. We can't love everybody. We don't know everybody. 
Well, we love our community. Well, we feel at home. We know a lot of people. That's good. But more particularly, more intensely, there's feeling of love for an individual. And I'm not just talking about romantic love, although that's part of it. The love between a husband and wife is, is primary here. But we're talking about love of friendship of an individual, a family member, a friend, something along that line. Those are all parts of what it means to love neighbor. One person, the group of people, and the entire race is all wrapped up in our love of neighbor. And then, so the fifth then is the idea, love your neighbor as yourself. It kind of begins there. We really can't love one another if we don't love ourselves. And so that's an important aspect. So that's what we're called to do. It seems simple enough, but the reality is it's all in theory unless we actually act it out in our lives. And so how do we act this all out in our lives each and every day? And that's the challenge for us as Christians as well. So gospel love is lived out. It's not just in principle. It's not just we talk a good game. But by our actions, by our total being, by the unity of who we are, we live those loves of God, neighbor, and self. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rearrange them a little bit just for the sake of my discussion and talk about self-love, neighborly love, communal love, particular love, and love of God, and see how that all works together in our life. Okay? Self-love, well, we kind of feel a little funny about that. Because part of our call to be Christian, there's a humility involved. There's a care for others, maybe even more than ourselves. But one of the things I think we have to recognize is though, but we have to, we have to have a love of self. We have to have a sense that I am worthwhile. There is something valuable in me that's worth everything in life. Um, the great theologian, Johannes Metz always said that in saying yes to God, it begins with saying yes to yourself. It begins with accepting who you are and saying that this is who God made and I am good and God loves me. And so me as I am, accept who I am, I love who I am, and then I'm able to return to God. That's a very important reality, to have a sense of love for self. But we always feel funny about self-love, and so maybe a better thing to do, if I can bring this up properly, is that we express that self-love, maybe better to call it self-esteem, to have a good sense of who we are. I'll tell you, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been telling this story for a while about my niece when she was four years old. Um, one of my nieces when she was four it was a little, a little rambunctious. And around that time, my mother, the grandmother, was getting a little older, and she was having trouble keeping up with her. And they were walking through a shopping mall, and they saw a little kid, and the mother had like a tether around the boy to keep him in line. And my mother said to her, now, Melanie, if you don't settle down, I'm going to get you one of these. And the girl just looked shocked, and she turned to him and said, but, but Grandma, I'm people. I'm thinking, that's a good sense of who you are. That's a good sense of self-esteem. She knew that she was worthwhile. She deserved better than that, she thought. Now, the funny thing is, I've been telling that story since she's been four years old. Next week's her 40th birthday party. <laughs> I think I need to find some newer stories, but the point is still the same. There has to be that reality of liking yourself, loving yourself, and again, self-love sounds a little bit egotistic and all, but to have a sense of self-esteem. I'm worthwhile. I'll tell you, I've been doing retreat work for a while in my time with the seminary. I've done some counseling, spiritual direction, even with priests. And I'm amazed sometimes, good, holy priests, they love God's people, they see the good in God's people, but not in themselves. And I've always asked them, you, God loves everyone. Yeah, but not me. That somehow they were less than someone else. And that's, that's dangerous. That leads us off right from the start. We have to begin with a healthy, healthy, sense of self-esteem, not overboard, but to see that there is good in us. There's a famous quote, if I can find it, maturity comes when we stop blaming God for making us the way we are. That when we can accept even the failings in our life, that this is the way we are, not that means we give up trying to change, but there's an acceptance of this is how God made me 
and this is what I have to do to deal with that reality, and this is what I have to do to accept myself. Um, when I was a college student, I had a big poster in my room, you've probably seen the banner, please be patient, God isn't finished with me yet. There's some value in that phrase as well, because we are always growing, we are always changing, but at the same time we have to recognize there is value in us, and we need to have a healthy sense of self-esteem. Okay? We'll balance this off in a minute, but I just want to set up these the way uh, we're called to be. Okay, so we are good, we are worthwhile as individuals, <clears throat> and we need to accept ourselves as individuals. Excuse me. So that moves us back to those love of neighbor. And as I said before, our first love of neighbor is love of neighbor in general. And to recognize that all of us, all of us have a sense of responsibility to care for the greater good, to care for the human race. And for most of that, we express that as we see there in ministry, in being the people of God, in being of service to one another. One of my favorite memories when I was newly ordained, I was working with CYO as we had him back then, a youth group, and there was a wonderful young girl, so talented in all this stuff. We sent her to a workshop, and she came back all excited. And I asked why, she said, well, because I found out I'm a minister. She had never thought of the fact that she had something to offer someone else. And in the role that she had in the youth group, she was actually helping her, her friends. So she was excited about the reality of being called to ministry. And I think that's so important for us, all of us. Vatican II kind of expanded the version of ministry. Back in the days, we thought of ministry, or the nuns minister and the priest minister, but that's it. But we have lay ministers, we have deacons, we have people serving in so many ways. And in a sense, any action, any human activity that continues the work of Christ can be a ministry. And so for those of you who read from the, from the, from the pulpit, read, read the scripture reading, them, that's a ministry of lecturing, ministry of ushering, ministry of, of being of service to your God's people in the church. That's all a call. And through that ministry, we show our love for God and neighbor. And that's an important reality that we need to remember. So that neighborly love, we live in our ministry for one another. Some people dedicate their life to ministry. Some people, as we'll see in a moment, that ministry is seen most in their love for their family, but it is still any work, any activity that furthers the work of Jesus Christ, that brings Christ's love into the world, is a ministry. And that's what we're all called to do. Communal love, as I said, we, we're called to live in community. And that's something that I believe this parish has a very beautiful sense of, at least those who are active in the parish. But we need to be able to share that with others who may not feel that welcomed. But people need a place where they belong. To use the cliche, a place where everybody knows their name, I'm not sure about that. But to be at least to know that here I am comfortable. Here I'm among my own kind of people. Here are people that are, that are like me, that have the same values that I do. And so that idea of community is an important aspect of the love of neighbor because there we have a sense that here I belong, here I am at peace with God and with his people. And that's a wonderful reality to, to have in our lives. Now as far as particular love, as I said, um, I'll call that friendship. That we're called to love some people more than others. We just re re we relate to some and I'm talking here more friends than, again, obviously the most important relationship is the relationship of man and woman in marriage. But for others, we have friends in everyone. Um, I think that that's, that's a reality that we need to know. One of the stories I always use, in fact, last year, a year ago tomorrow, I was on here talking about uh, uh, Gethsemane. And one of the points I always make is that Jesus had people he liked more than others. He called Peter and James and John and Andrew aside sometimes. He seemed to have a closer relationship to them. And it's just natural for us as believers to know that we need individuals that we relate to more closely. All of this can be just in general, unless in the give and take of a real relationship, there we can experience God's love in a beautiful way that gives us strength and all. And so that idea of friendship is something that I think is crucial for all of us. 
and that's something that we need to we, we need to re reflect upon and to see the friendship is something that should be leading us to God that there should be something healthy about that friendship we'll talk about that in a minute as well so it's important that we see that reality that love of a particular love in a particular individual again for the welfare for the goodness of the human race for the goodness of ourselves and the individual that friendship is an important aspect that covers our life and then finally love of God well I'll use that up sum that up by prayer prayer and worship how do we show that love for God God who in many ways doesn't need our love but he certainly deserves it that we show that by our prayer and so that's a way that's a sign of love and that's an important reality. By the way, when, when, when we're done, I, I have this all on, a, on one little handout here. I'll give that to you afterwards. But I didn't, want to, I didn't want to give it away too quickly, so we'll keep that till the end. But the idea of loving God, we show God's love in our prayer, I think is an important reality. Now, if we live these five virtues, these five realities of self-esteem, of working ministry, of being part of a community, of having friends, of spending time with God with prayer, it sounds like a pretty good life, doesn't it? It sounds like a holy life. It sounds like the way of the heart that we've been talking about in terms of how do we find Christ in our life. But unfortunately, if this is all we do, our life can still be a little bit off-centered. It can be out of balance because if you look at this, all of this demands some kind of effort. All of this is hard work. We need to find a sense of balance. And this is something that took me, I think, in my own life, years to understand. But it's a reality that we have to be able to, to find in our own life that there is um, a need to balance, not to be so involved in one way of doing something that we miss a lot of the other realities, a lot of beauty of life. And so what I'm gonna to offer to you today, with these being the goods that we show as our love of neighbor, at the same time, we have to find balance in our lives, in our love as well. And this is what helps us to be holy and happy people who can survive the challenges of living in the modern world. So we're not just a question of all the time um, being serious about what we're doing. It's a question of being, our, having our life balanced with other virtues, other values that give us a little bit better perspective. So, to go along with that, I said, that, I said when we started talking about self-esteem that we feel funny talking about self-love because we were told in many ways to, to humble ourselves, to put ourselves before God, not to see ourselves as important, see everybody else as important. But at the same time, we can go too far and lose ourselves a sense of self-esteem. I said that. So we really have to balance that self-esteem. Well, we can call it self-denial. And there's a Christian virtue in terms of sacrifice, of offering ourselves, offering our times, offering, offering our time, offering our talent, giving of ourselves. That shouldn't take away from our self-esteem, it should help to build our self-esteem. I've always preached one thing about humility is not thinking that you have nothing to offer. True humility is being realistic about who you are and what you have to offer, but recognizing it's God's the source. So that self-esteem is a gift from God, but we give that self back to God and to his people. So self-denial, but you know, even self-denial and through the years, the church sometimes went overboard. And sometimes, to be honest, and it's a little warning as we begin the season of Lent, we can overdo the sacrifices. We can think we have to really almost punish ourselves. And I don't think that's what Jesus calls us to is all. So better than self-denial, although that's part of it, sacrifice is part of it, I like to use the term self-transcendence to move outside ourselves, to rec recognize that my wants and what, who I am is not the only be-all and end-all, that there has to be some offering, some moving out from myself in order to be there for others. And so we have to love ourselves, we have to see ourselves as good and holy, but at the same time we have to realize because God has given me so much, I must move out and deny myself, but more than that, move beyond myself, transcend myself to be the person that I'm called to be. And so that sense of transcendence is a good thing to, to think of in terms of how we uh, balance not being too full of ourselves, but at the same time, the danger if we give, if we give ourselves too much, we, we, we lose ourselves in the process. So that healthy balance between self-esteem and self-denial, self-transcendence, I think allows us to have that love of self 
that really the rest of this is built on. So, if ministry is the second reality, ministry, maybe we could even put that maybe better, I think I have it here, I do, is, is work. Because we, won't, we may not see what we do in caring for the world as ministry, we might see it just as work to be done. Um, all work and no play makes Jack a sad, whatever the expression is. Um, we need to balance that ministry with leisure. We need to take that Sabbath day. We need to take that break every now and then. Because sometimes we feel guilty taking time for ourselves. But again, if you are all about ministry, service, 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 work, 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 it is bad for the health. It's bad to give yourself so much that you don't take some time back for yourself. And so I always said this to people, you know, people come up to me, again, ministry with priests, you know, I feel guilty when I take a day off. I'm thinking, no, see it as part of your spiritual life. See it as taking care of yourself so that the work you do is better because you're a better person. You're at peace, you're healthy. Don't see it as a constant giving of yourself, but sometimes you have to refresh yourself in order to be of better service to others. And so love of neighbor means both serving them, but also making sure you're the best person you can be, and you have the rest and you have the strength to do what you need to do. The same reality comes when we're dealing with community. It's good to be in community, but to be, some, to be honest, sometimes we need a break. Sometimes we're around people so much that we begin to lose a sense of ourself. And so I think that community and that value of community needs to be balanced with solitude. We see that in the Gospels. We saw this this past Sunday's Gospel. After Jesus healed, he went to a deserted place and the people followed and found him. And so that's a, per a perfect reality, a perfect Christian value to see signs not only in community, the value of community, the worship of community, but at the same time we need some time in solitude. And again, that's one thing Lent calls us back to maybe better than anything else, to spend some time in a retreat, an evening like this, whatever it might be, that we spend time caring for our own needs, refreshing ourselves, spending time alone. And again, we have Jesus as the model for that. And we have the whole uh, setup of the of, of week in terms of, of having that Sabbath day, having that chance to get alone, away, to rest, to be at peace, to be alone is, is a reality that I think is very important. With friendship, and so again I have on here sheets slash family, in that individual love that we share so much, which is important that we just don't talk about love, but we, we live it in how we treat another human being. One of the dangers for that is that when there is an intense love, when there's a tense relationship, it can close in on itself so that all you're worried about is the other person. And that can lead us away from God as well. That can lead us to be so concerned for the individual that we forget the higher purposes around. And so one of the things that I believe friendship needs to be balanced with is a sense of, I'll call generativity, which means something comes from this relationship that becomes, moves beyond you and the other person. Something is born from that reality. Now the obvious one for this is children. A husband, the love of a husband and wife is so intense but it produces a love. And gener generativity is really one of the um, great goals in anybody's life is to have a legacy, to leave something behind, to make a difference in the world. And how we do that is what difference do we make? How have we changed the world? For most of us we find that in children. We live on in our children and our grandchildren. We've made a difference. We brought these people into the world. The world will go on. But we all need some kind of generativity, something to say we've made a difference. And we made a difference when we take the love of another person, we take the strength that that gives us, but we don't keep it to ourselves. We share it with the world somehow. I will be honest, I always wondered about this as far as the life of a priest when you don't have children in law. But the best way you can have a sense of generativity as a priest in my life has been, I spent 27 years working in seminaries. And it was really easy because then I can say, ah, I see the difference I made or try to make 
in the life of the priests that I had a chance to, to, to teach and to work with that have gone on. So you see these young guys walking around. In fact, I've gotten in the habit of calling them my boys because I was, I was the rector of the seminary. But it's a sense of generativity. It's a sense of I made a difference. I did something. I have some kind of lasting impact on the world. We all need that in some ways. Again, for most of us, it's through children and grandchildren. But for most of for others, it can be in the accomplishments we make. Accomplishments we make. Teachers have a wonderful openness to generativity because you can see the difference you've made in your students. But that has to be that going out from oneself. The intense relationships, the friendships we have are so good for us individually and for the other person, but we have to be such such a way that has to generate a love that goes beyond the two of you. I always used to say that before with friendships, you can always tell, you know when you walk in on two friends talking and you feel like you're intruding, that they just want to be with each other? versus those when you walk in and you can just feel the sense of love and feel welcomed by them because they're not thinking just of themselves, they're thinking outwardly. They're strengthened by each other to be able to love others as well. And I think that's a beautiful, beautiful power, the beautiful strength that, that comes from that. So that sense of friendship, again, not turning in on oneself, but being able to generate something beautiful in the world, generate something that goes beyond. And then finally, and I, loved, I like this one the best, how do you balance a sense of prayer? Any suggestions? Sense of humor. Because prayer, praying is serious business. Spending time with God is serious work. But we have to balance that with a sense of humor. To be able to laugh at ourselves and not be so intense because God has a sense of humor, and God gives us our sense of humor. I'll say this in a minute ago, Pope Francis has been wonderful in reminding us that a Christian without a sense of humor is missing something. And it's missing that sense of balance, that they're so serious about serious matters, good matters, nothing wrong with that. But you need to be able to see the joy in the world. You need to be able to take yourself a little less seriously and be able to laugh at your foibles and your shortcomings and eccentricities. To be able to balance that sense of prayer with a sense of humor is something that I think is, is important. And so there, now we have the way of the heart, the way that we live love in our lives that finds a sense of balance, a sense of purpose, a sense of, of healthiness that without balancing one with the other, we can go, we can short circuit ourselves very quickly. And so to love God means to be with God in prayer, but to also at the same time to be able to be comfortable with God, to be able to laugh at ourselves in the situation of the world and still find God's presence in the midst of that, not to take everything so seriously. To love neighbor, well, we serve the world, we serve the community, we serve our family, but we balance that off with a sense of taking a break, of being alone, and of being constantly aware that it's not all about me. That's about what I leave for the world. So that love of neighbor gives a sense of balance in our life. And then finally, a sense of self-esteem, which again, we feel uncomfortable, but we all need to feel good about ourselves. We all need healthy self-esteem. I pray every day for the young people in our world because it is so hard with so social media, with the demands of bullying, all this other stuff, for kids to feel good about themselves. And they need parents and godparents to help them. They need us to pray for them. They need that sense of, I am worthwhile. I remember that old poster, uh, mission land uh, have somebody, for a little boy in a ghetto, and the, the phrase was, God made me, God don't make junk. That's a message that we need to get out to our, our children, our grandchildren, to young people, because that sense of self-esteem is important. But we can't build ourselves so up that all we care about is ourselves. There has to be that sense of going beyond, that self-transcendence that comes along at the same time. Okay, so there are five kinds of love coming from the two commandments of loving God and loving our neighbors ourselves that gives us work to do, but also something to balance that, that allows us a sense of fullness. Okay, and like I said, for those of you, if anybody's screwing things down, I do have sheets for this. Um, I have them up here. We'll give them out before you, you go along. Any questions before I kind of wrap, start wrapping things up? Yes, yes sir.
Right. And, and you know, anything I say is going to sound trivial because it is, because my first response is we just have to keep loving. You know, we can't let that change our, our belief in the value of the human peop people. Um, there, there's reasons for these divisions. There's sad histories beyond that. And we just have to be people of love. We have to say, we're going to keep doing what we believe is right. We're going to keep helping people. We're going to keep, keep believing the goodness of people. Um, and we have to hope that it makes a difference. That's, I think, where, where that prayer can come on and can become so serious. You know, this is no laughing matter, obviously, but we have to be able to recognize that this is the way it is and God give us strength to do this and we do the best that we can in an impossible situation. I agree with you. There's, and I, I don't have much more of an answer than that. We just have to keep doing what we're supposed to do and just trust in God. You know, uh, if you look at in the Old Testament, the... Uh, the history of the, of the Hebrew people, and you know, from one from one catastrophe after the other, trying to find God in the midst of that was hard sometimes. But when they, when they did, they were able to to find that strength to keep going, to to recuperate and move on. And that's what we need to do. We just can't 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 abandon our belief in the goodness of God, even when we don't see it all around us and other people. Okay. Any other? I just wanted to, uh, I'm not going to go into all of this. First of all, I don't have time because we have to, I want to end with some time and prayer. But just to kind of uh, maybe back up what I said with some more modern things, um, the, the word of the Holy Father, Pope Francis, I mentioned that briefly with his, his wonderful reality of the need for a sense of humor. But it's, it's already, I can't believe it's already six years ago that he came out with Gaudete et exultate, which was a call to holiness in the, today's world. And what he really was doing is kind of backing up what I was saying. I've been doing this for, for years with this the kind of thing. But it, what he has to say is kind of in, in keeping with that. Um, I have a little outline. We're not going to go through all this. One of the things he talks about is the example of the saints. And he, it was a wonderful idea of the saints next door. And I know you all can think of a saint who used to live next door or in the neighborhood that you can think of. And we need that, especially with the way the world is going, that in the midst of that, there's still somebody who cares for their enemy, who cares, who tries to bring love, who tries to bring peace, to try to find another way to do, do that. There are saints next door all around us. The good people that, that had a tough time in life, that had struggled, that you think somehow God wasn't fair to them, but yet they persevered and they lived their faith. So that the example of the saints, the famous saints we hear about, but the example of the saints among us. And I think we probably, I would dare say we all have somebody in our family that was able to live their faith no matter what challenges they faced. That's, he had a beautiful image of that to begin with. Um, he, I'm not going to go into that. There, there's, there's challenges in the world today. Some of the challenges is that we think too much of our mind. We think we can figure everything else out. That's Gnosticism. That's not important. Or we think that our willpower will solve everything. And that, again, is not recognizing how much we need God in our life. That's not important. But this is what I wanted to talk about. The Beatitudes as a chance... The Pope always refers to the Beatitudes as God's identity card, as our identity card, rather, the Christian. You know, the European, South American traditions, we have driver's license. Well, they have some kind of ID with them always. We should keep the Beatitudes, which, again, reverses the values of the world. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the meek. That's not the value of the world. And the values of the world seem to be, getting, to be winning but yet we need to be, keep these beatitudes all among us. But the reason I did this, put this in is for this fourth chapter. This is what Pope Francis six years ago said are the signs of holiness. And they're different words, but don't they fit into that values, these, these ten values that I just presented with you as well. Perseverance, patience, and meekness. Okay? Not to give up. To keep striving no matter how difficult it might be. To be patient with one another. Um... That doesn't mean we stand by and let people abuse one another, but it means we be patient when people are struggling with the little things, with the, with the lesser struggles in their life. And with meekness, their sense of humility, that sense of self-transcendence I just said. Uh, joy and a sense of humor. If you have to think of one reality that Pope Francis constantly brings is the idea of joy. That no matter, and that doesn't mean joy, doesn't mean laughter, and doesn't mean you don't take anything seriously. But joy means there's a, there's a happiness about you. There's a sense of well-being about you in anything that you do. 
No matter what we're doing, no matter how serious the work, we have to be joyful in the midst of that. Um, I think it was the, the philosopher Nietzsche who didn't believe anything. And his greatest critique of Christians was, you don't look redeemed. Because if we believe that Jesus Christ has saved us, no matter what we're facing now, we've already been saved in Jesus Christ, there should be a sense of relief and a sense of joy that we can share. And he didn't believe because he didn't see it in how people live their lives. And so we have to be people of joy, have to maintain some kind of sense of humor just to survive in the world. And that's a, po a point that the Pope often has said today. And yet at the same time, and it's not contradictory, we need to be bold, we need to be passionate, we need to stand up for things and believe in things. I think it's a value, again, to be true to who you are. That's a very, very important value. Again, we just talked about this, to be in community. Not to be a loner, but to be part of a group, to be part of people who believe, to seek out like-minded individuals, and to be in constant prayer. One could take my 10 terms and put his five things here and see that there is indeed a, uh, a consistency, a value in what we are called to do. And so Pope Francis, through his ministry, through his life, through his example, the always smiling, always trying to be a positive force, even in a painful world, and yet not to be a pushover, to stand up for what needs to be said. I think there's a value there that that needs to, needs to be done. Any other questions right now? I know it's hard with the group and listening to the message and all that stuff. I'll be around afterwards if anybody wants to ask me anything. Again, we have enough of these to go around that has this all kind of laid out for you. But I thought what would be good as we be stand again on the threshold of Lent, um, is to, we talked about at the beginning, the way of the heart, and it's the heart that's the source of unity for the person. And again, with the theme of the Sacred Heart here in the parish, I thought it would be good to end with the litany of the Sacred Heart. Um, and doing this might be, a little, I have to make sure I hit the button at the right time. Um, so, if you can see it, I think, every, can everybody read those? Or did I make the print too small? The, the, the black italic is your line the, at the end. So I'll, I'll read, uh, I'll read the, the, the first part and you respond there and hopefully I'll push the button when the time is supposed to happen and we'll begin and we'll, we'll, we'll close with the, uh, the litany of the Sacred Heart. So we'll begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, hear us. God, the Father in heaven. God, the Son, Redeemer of the world. God the Holy Spirit, Holy Trinity, one God, heart of Jesus, Son of the Eternal Father, heart of Jesus formed by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary, heart of Jesus substantially united to the Word of God, heart of Jesus of infinite majesty, heart of Jesus, sacred temple of God, Heart of Jesus, Tabernacle of the Most High. Heart of Jesus, House of God and Gate of Heaven. Heart of Jesus, Burning Furnace of Charity. Heart of Jesus, Abode of Justice and Love. Heart of Jesus, Full of Goodness and Love. Heart of Jesus, Source of All Virtues. Heart of Jesus, Most Worthy of All Praise. Heart of Jesus, King and center of all hearts. Heart of Jesus, in whom all are treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Heart of Jesus, in whom dwells the fullness of divinity. Heart of Jesus, in whom the Father was well pleased. Heart of Jesus, whose fullness we have all received. Heart of Jesus, desire of the everlasting hills. Heart of Jesus, patient and most merciful. Heart of Jesus, enriching all who invoke you. Heart of Jesus, fountain of life and holiness. Heart of Jesus, loaded down with our disgrace. Heart of Jesus, bruised for our offenses. Heart of Jesus, obedient unto death. Heart of Jesus, pierced with a lance. Heart of Jesus, source of all consolation. Heart of Jesus, our life and resurrection. Heart of Jesus, our peace and reconciliation. 
Heart of Jesus, victim of our sins. Heart of Jesus, salvation of all who trust in you. Heart of Jesus, hope for those who die in you. Heart of Jesus, delight of all the saints. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus, meek and humble of heart. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, look upon the heart of your dearly beloved Son and upon the praise and satisfaction he offers you in the name of sinners and for those who seek your mercy. Be appeased and grant us pardon in the name of the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you forever and ever. Amen. Well, thank you. I hope there is something here to begin the season of Lent to think about, and I've enjoyed it immensely. Um, and I'm glad to be a part of this community and I look forward to continuing to serve you. I believe there's somebody who has to say goodbye. <laughs>